Hey, Wong, wie geht's? Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, and hope you are super energized for the afternoon talks. You had a great uh, lunch, and everybody's ready to talk about cross-site scripting. So uh, my name is Benedek Gadi. This is my Twitter handle. If you prefer to follow along the slides on your own device, you can do that. I posted them there, so you can just like visit. Uh, so what's up with security? I mean, if your only source of uh, information is Hollywood movies, then you might have a really strange idea, like what's this whole cyber sec security thing? So usually these movies fall into two categories. We're either rooting for the hacker, like uh, for Angelina Jolie in um, Hackers. Then, and these kind of hackers are usually like really cool and they can hack into basically anything. Or the other category is when we root for the person defending the world or the, their family from the evil hackers, uh, and they will do anything to stop them. For example, Bruce Willis in Die Hard 4 actually <laughs> rams a police car into a helicopter mid-air just to stop the hackers. Or an even better example, the good guys in the latest Fast and Furious movie actually attack a frigging submarine with cars just to stop the hackers. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but that kind of makes me a bit uncomfortable. Uh, but even if we come back to the, re uh, come back to the world of reality a bit, I'm still a bit uncomfortable. You see, if, uh, if I read a, a security-related book or listen to a talk or read a blog post, they usually, not all of them, but usually they are uh, aimed towards security ex experts. And the thing is that sometimes it's not, so it's not a problem by default because, uh, yeah, security experts need their, to get their information from somewhere. But for me, as like a regular web developer who tries to juggle like accessibility, performance, end-to-end -end testing, the new frameworks, all these things, this is just a bit scary. Just like Caroline talked about it, sometimes just a few jargon words can make you a bit uncomfortable, and when you're slightly uncomfortable, it's a lot harder to focus on what actually matters. So, yeah, I'd like to be as cool as Angelina Jolie and just like inline skate uh, my way through the city and hack into anything, or be as brave as Bruce Willis and like jump out of buildings to stop the next uh, hacker attack. Uh, but I'm not. I'm, to go with the movie analogy, I'm basically just a guy sitting in the seventh row, <laughs> like eating the popcorn, trying to enjoy the movie, not get hurt maybe going down the stairs. Uh, so that's why I think, uh, besides the, like, the traditional black hat and white hat categories, we need a third kind of like, category. Uh, so let me introduce you to just enjoy the show and try to learn from it, hat. <laughs> yeah, I know it, it sounds silly and it's basically just a joke, but bear with me here. I, I really strongly believe, in, believe that uh, you don't have to be an expert to be able to enjoy something. And the thing is that uh, with... Um, with many, many things, first, they seem really scary, but if you just use what you have already and add just a bit of extra, you can reach this level where you actually enjoy it, and when you start enjoying it, you start to see a beauty of it, it's a lot easier to progress. To give you an example, I'm, I'm a huge tea addict, and to answer uh, Paul's question, yeah, tea is what gives me my energy. Uh, and I drink, I drink a lot, lots of kinds of tea, but when I first heard about the most, like, esteemed or most prestigious kind of tea, poor, I was like, what's this thing? Is this like a bird's nest or something? Like, <laughs> what's this? But, not, but then I started digging into it and started reading a bit more uh, about this and actually tried to taste it. And in a really short time, uh, I uh, arrived to a level where I'm able to appreciate the, like, the fine delicacy, the fine things about it. And actually, it's not easier to progress from here because I know, I know what I'm looking for. So with this talk today about XSS, uh, one of my goals is obviously to maybe show you a few kinds of XSS attacks that you might not have heard about. But my most, more important goal is to show you how beautiful, how creative this, this stuff can be. And maybe if you see the creativity behind it and all these interesting tricks, maybe it will be easier for you to just add that tiny bit of extra knowledge you need from getting to like a web developer where you know JavaScript and the browser and web development in general to be able to actually appreciate this whole new domain. So let's get into it. When you're talking about XSS, you can't really uh, not uh, avoid mentioning Sammy, uh, who is basically the inventor of this kind of attack. So in 2005, uh, he had a MySpace profile and he added there uh, a piece of script uh, that caused 
any, any, anybody else who had like a MyFrace profile and visited their uh, Sammy's profile to add an extra sentence to their own profile, saying, but most of all, Sammy is my hero. <laughs> and besides that sentence, to also add the same malicious script, so it started spreading. And in only 20 hours, 20 hours, one million uh, MySpace profiles were infected. In 2005, and everybody wasn't walking around with internet in, the, in their pockets. So that's pretty uh, impressive. Uh, you know who thought this wasn't impressive? Uh, the jury who trialed Sammy. And he was sentenced uh, for three years. He wasn't allowed to access the internet. So yeah, that's, that's pretty sad. Uh, but don't, don't worry about him. He's fine. <laughs> He's actually a super famous uh, like security researcher. He gives great talks. Anyway, uh, this kind of XSS attack that he performed is basically the most well-known. And I think mo uh, many of you might have heard about it. So it goes like this. An attacker writes a malicious script and somehow injects it into a page. This somehow is basically maybe uh, put it, uh, right, putting it into an input field or some similar way. The point is that this malicious script is saved on the server. And when somebody else comes and tries to visualize that page, for example, Sammy's my, my, um, MySpace profile page, they download this script and it's executed on their own machine. So basically, the attacker writes it on their own, puts it on the server, and then anybody who opens that page has something malicious running on their own machine, and then bad things happen. Uh, yeah, that's all, folks. Thank you for coming. See you at the after party. Uh, no, obviously, uh, this is uh, just where the rabbit hole starts, but i like to stop here for a second, because if you know this much, that's already super cool and will help you a lot in actually avoid these kind of attacks on your own side. But the point of this talk is to get deeper, so let's keep going. Uh, there are many ways to classify these kinds of attacks. Uh, I really like this two-dimensional thing, where, uh, a one, where one attack can be um, like categorized along the two axes. So the one I just showed you is a stored non-DOM-based attack. Let's see about the other ones. So uh, the, the, another type uh, is called reflected XSS. So imagine you have a, a URL. It's like a regular bank or something, where you have a URL parameter, let's say a name. And that name uh, will be taken out by the server, if there's server-side rendering, or the page itself, and put in somewhere. For example, as a greeting, if it's a name, uh, it will take it out of the parameter and say, hi, Ben, or something like that. What if, instead of that name, I put in a malicious script? If there's no sanitization, it will still take that uh, value from the variable, put it into the page, and it will run uh, on whoever's uh, machine who opens this link. So in this case, the attack flow is a bit different. Uh, the attacker constructs uh, a URL containing the malicious scripts, sends it to the victim, and the victim, if they click on it, if they open it, they send a request to the server. And if it's like a server-side rendered uh, page, uh, the server will take this uh, URL parameter, which is like, not dangerous at that point, but then it renders it into the page. So when the uh, uh, victim down, uh, gets the response with the whole content, the page will contain, uh, besides all the other things, this malicious script. It will run on their machine. Bad things happen. Uh, so this is one axis. The other axis is also interesting, but uh, right now I won't go into that much detail about it. Uh, it's basically called non-DOM-based and DOM-based, but it's a lot easier uh, for me, at least, to think about it uh, as server-rendered and browser-rendered. So basically the idea here is that uh, in the case of the uh, earlier mentioned reflected XSS attack, if that name parameter is rendered into the page on the server, then it's a non-DOM based. But if it's, for example, part of a fragment, so it's not, not even sent to the server, but then some JavaScript takes it out from the uh, URL and puts it into the page, then it's browser rendered. So that, that's the difference. I think it's cool to point this out, because this kind of shows that it doesn't matter how, how or where you construct uh, your page, you're still vulnerable to, to these kinds of attacks. So you can't say that, hey, I have an SPA, I'm, I'm not vulnerable. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, let's go deeper. So from this, you might have learned that uh, I mean, uh, user inputs uh, are bad. 
uh, you have to kind of take care of uh, what happens, what the users uh, try to send you, and you have to sanitize it somewhere. But where? Basically, you have three options. Either on the client side before sending them, on server side, on client side when they arrive. So the first one is kind of out of the question because like client side sanitization is pretty easy to uh, circumvent. You can just like send a request without uh, uh, using uh, the page itself or just turn off JavaScript, stuff like that. So that's out of the question. So it's either server side or client side. But the problem is you might have noticed this uh, if you uh, developed anything for a browser that browsers are super weird. So Here's this uh, little code example. It's invalid HTML. It's, it's not valid. You wouldn't write this normally. But the thing is, the browser is like, super helpful. They try to help you out uh, if it's not XHTML. If it's HTML, they, they try to help you out. So do you have a guess how this will render? What the browser will render if you uh, send this code? Well, it will uh, render a div. And inside the div, uh, a script tag with a title attribute that has the closing div tab in. And then, because the browser is like a really good friend of yours, and he's like, I got you, he will, scroll, uh, he will close the script tag and also close the div tag. OK, this doesn't seem too dangerous. It's strange, but OK. Let's uh, switch the two. So let's have the script tag outside and the div inside. So the same thing should happen, right? Yeah, it should, but browsers are weird. Uh, it will actually render a script tag inside it, uh, the div tag with the title as a string, and then close the script tag, and then just like a parenthesis at the end. Why does this happen? Why there's a difference? So the thing is that the browser, if, if it sees a, a div tag, he says that, OK, inside a div tag, I'm expecting HTML. So it tries, tries to parse the stuff inside as HTML. But if it sees an opening script tag, it says that, oh, I expect a script here. So it will take everything until the closing script tag and try to parse it as JavaScript. Oh, obviously, this will like fail. This is not JavaScript. Uh, but still, you see there's a difference. Uh, and that's why sanitizing on the server side is super hard, because you, you get an arbitrary, arbitrary HTML uh, string. You have no idea what the browser will actually render. So that uh, kind of means that we have to do the sanitization on the client side. And these kind of changes uh, open a door for a, an attack that's called uh, mutation XSS, because the browser mutates uh, the thing you send it to him and comes up with something surprising sometimes. Uh, so how do we defend against uh, MXSS? Well, one thing you could do is to take this string, create a div element, and then set it as inner HTML. In our example, we could set like an image with an invalid source and an on error attribute uh, set with a, a malicious script. So usually, if you uh, have an image with an invalid source, uh, it tries to download it. It can't. So if there's an on error attribute, it will run the JavaScript that's inside. So basically, this is uh, one way to inject uh, malicious code into a site. You, ju you just uh, create an invalid image, and the thing inside on error will run. So if we do this, and we set the div's inner HTML with this image, we'll have a bad time. Because with divs, it works like this. It parses the string, but then it also interprets it. So basically, the thing in on error will actually run. So we didn't, before we could check if it was all right or not, it actually ran. So again, bad times. It would be so cool, and here I'm going to quote the documentation, if we had something that is a mechanism for holding HTML that is not to be rendered immediately when a page is loaded but maybe instantiate it later. It would be so cool if we had something like that, right? Yeah, it's a uh, spoiler alert, we do. It's called uh, a template tag. Has anybody ever used a template tag? Oh, that's nice. I haven't before I read this. Uh, so uh, the cool thing about the template tag is that when we set its inner HTML, it's, uh, the code inside won't be interpreted. It's parsed, but not interpreted. So Anything evil inside won't run, but we can use the existing DOM uh, functions and just like clean it up. For example, in case of images, we can remove all the unwanted attributes. We can use like a blacklist or a whitelist, that doesn't really matter. We can clean it up, and then we can set the value of the template in our HTML to the divs in our HTML, and then we can render that. 
cool, we have a really good defense against this. And it always works, right? <laughs> so earlier this year, uh, actually, a Japanese XSS researcher, whose name I'm not able to pronounce, really sorry for that, uh, found out that the Google search bar, basically the most viewed page on the Earth, had an XSS vulnerability. And that uh, vulnerability was actually based on uh, mutation XSS. And I'm going to show you how that happened. So this, I think, short script is enough to demonstrate how, how this works. So we have a no script tag. Inside it, uh, a P tag with a title that has a, a string inside that there's like a closing no script tag and an evil image that I showed you earlier. So we know how, how to defend against these things. We set it for a template uh, element. OK, the template element will render this, a no script tag inside a p tag, uh, and inside it a p tag with a title that contains a string that has like a bunch of things in it, but it's not important because it's a string. It will, it will never run. It will never execute. So we find, right? We can, we can render this. Well, if you set the same string to a div, you'll get something different. You'll get a no script tag, inside it a p tag, closing the no script tag, and the scary part, the image, the evil image. So basically, if we put anything after the closing no script tag, it will be rendered as is, not as part of the title of the p tag. So again, bad things happen. And then some closing tags that the browser puts there. So what's the reason behind it? Well, I was like, OK, that no script tag looks strange. I usually don't uh, see it that often. So let's read the documentation. And I did that. And I read it a few times. Uh, and then uh, uh, on my third or fourth run through, I, I saw that the solution was in the first line. Uh, it says that the no script tag represents nothing if scripting is enabled and represents a, uh, its children if scripting is disabled. So the thing is, in, in, in uh, template tags, the scripting is disabled. In div tags, scripting is enabled. And that's where the difference comes from. And I, I really like this example because it's so cool that the researcher took things that are not dangerous by themselves, like nobody's scared of no script tags by, just by themselves, and then combined them to a really, I think, a super, super dangerous attack. Because if you can send people with Google search links that contain malicious scripts, those, you can reach a lot of, lot of people. So this is the kind of creativity I talked about earlier. This is that extra beauty that I, I really enjoy in these things. OK, but what if you can't inject uh, an actual script? Because up until now, we were always injecting like JavaScript. No worries. There are still many ways to uh, hack a site. For example, if you're able to inject just a single line of CSS, that's already dangerous. Uh, for example, you could say that a background image and the URL and the link to your own site. OK, that's not too interesting. So it downloads an image. So what? Well, the thing is that when an image is downloaded, uh, a request is made to that server. And within that request, a lot of things travel that usually people don't think about. For example, a lot of personally identifiable information, like your IP address, the OS you're using, the browser, stuff like that. And OK, and, uh, if I manage to uh, inject a CSS like this into a site, I will find out all this information about the people who visit that site. OK, by itself, that's that's not dangerous, but it's information that a hacker can use to actually create a, a more dangerous attack. It's always like this. If the uh, attacker has more information, they have, they have uh, uh, more ways uh, to make a really precise attack. So it's not good to give out this information about the users to somebody else. Another way uh, you can uh, make uh, CSS scary is if you can actually inject not only like a property, but a whole selector. In this case, if you use, um, uh, for example, the checked uh, pseudo selector, you can see if, an, if um, uh, a checkbox was actually checked or not by a user. Because what's inside will actually happen only if that checkbox was checked. And if it was checked, a request will be made to the attacker's side with a parameter saying that, hey, the 2FA is not turned on at this user. So if uh, I manage to inject this to a site, wait a few days, and then I see that, OK, 
like 90% of the users of these sites don't turn on 2FA. Cool, then I know that I, I can use that fact to my advantage and, for example, uh, start uh, buying uh, leaked passwords and try uh, an attack, an enumeration attack like that. So it's these kind of informations by themselves are not that scary, but if you think how useful they are for a hacker, they become really scary. Another thing that you can do is use the visited pseudo selector. Uh, in this case, you can basically learn what the users clicked around uh, earlier before uh, visiting this site. And if there's like a really info important link, for example, the security, security tips uh, document, and they haven't visited it, uh oh, it means they don't know about the best practices, they are easier targets. And then again, you can add just like a, a parameter, like in ed uneducated true. So basically, using pseudo selectors, you can do user behavior tracking. But it gets even worse. Uh, there are attribute selectors. So you can check the value of, for example, a drop down box. Obviously, it's not like you can, you can't write a CSS that takes any kind of value and uh, sends it to a server. But if you know the, the possible values beforehand, for example, there's like a drop down box with like one or two or 100 uh, values, you can create like, or generate like 100 selectors and then you have a version for each and every one, and maybe you find out the super secret meeting location. Uh, and there's this thing about React. I don't know if you ever realized it. I haven't before, like uh, reading up a bit uh, more on, on CSS injections, is that if you have an input uh, field that's a password, React will automatically add uh, an attribute called value, and which will contain the password in plain text. So using this fact, and uh, the attribute selectors, you can actually write a keylogger using just CSS. It's, it's really complicated. I don't really have the time to go into the details, but look it up. There are like a, a few tutorials, or not tutorials, but like expl explanatory articles uh, on the net. <laughs> um, you have to have, as an attacker, you have to have lots of things going for you, so it's not trivial, but it's possible. And again, getting back to creativity, it's scary, but also super cool. Like, come on, these things weren't meant to be used like that. And somebody like figured it out. I find this actually beautiful. Uh, yeah. So I still have like uh, six, seven minutes from this talk, and but you were like a really good audience, so I'm giving you a present. Uh, <laughs> you thought that you're only going to learn about XSS, but here's like a bonus thing. You're also going to hear about on-site request forgery, or shortly OSERF. It's really hard to pronounce. I have no idea how. What's the correct thing? So the idea behind this attack, and it's, I'm talking about this because it's, it's uh, frequently used together with XSS. So the idea behind this attack is that if you have a page, it has a content, like HTML stuff, but it also has the cookies of the user who's viewing that page. And those cookies contain a lot of sensitive information. For example, the session ID, which is basically the most important stuff, and that's what hackers are going for. Uh, so. There's a malicious actor, and they somehow manage to inject a link into the site. So, not a script, not CSS, just a link. But this link has a very specific um, uh, target, a reference. And this reference points to the same page where this was injected. So, if it's a bank page, it's not pointing to myevilsite.com, it points to the same, uh, same bank's uh, API. So if a user clicks on this link, they will send a request to the server. Nothing dangerous about that, right? Well, the thing is that with this request, the cookies are also traveling. That's how the user is identified. But if the malicious actor uh, put there a very specific link, then basically it's like, like me asking somebody, ask, hey, here's this closed envelope. Please take it to your bank and tell it's from you and they will do what's inside that envelope. That's, that's scary, right? Because that envelope could contain stuff like, hey, send to uh, ban all your money. And the same could happen here, too, because if there's an API that, for example, exposes stuff like uh, make uh, admin of this user, then I can construct a link where that user is me, the attacker, and if an admin clicks on it, then because they are admin and they are authenticated via their cookies, it will actually happen, and the attacker will also become an admin. So uh, another example could be with the bank. 
to again, you have an, an, a link, and inside the reference, which points to send money, the send money API, with a given amount and a fixed account number, which is the attacker, attacker's account. So when somebody clicks there, it, they will actually make the call with their, their own user, and they will send their own money to the attacker. That's pretty nasty. But usually, usually sites are prepared against this, so it's, it's not so normal to have like possibilities to, hey, inject a link here. But it's still possible to achieve the same thing with the form. So in, in some ways, the form is pretty similar to a link, because you can set an action, which could be the same thing, and then uh, add, the, add the button there. When they click on the button, the form gets submitted, and basically, the same request is made. Uh, yeah, and you have to put something really intriguing to the, on the bottom, so they actually click it. Uh, but uh, so yeah, that, that's about that's. You can see that uh, these kind of attacks work even only if you can inject HTML and nothing else. But a subset of HTML is images, and I have to tell you, you have to really, really take care when when talking about images. And I, I don't only mean like bad memes from 9gag. Uh, I mean when you have like uh, upload profile photo and stuff like that, because images for me are really scary. Uh, we talked about earlier, earlier about this example uh, with the invalid source and the on error thing. But uh, it, this is, again, kind of well known. So uh, people will usually uh, uh, avoid getting hit by an attack like this by removing every other attribute or just giving you the chance to provide what's inside the source and nothing else. No problem. You can still do an OSurf with that. Again, the same method, uh, sending money to a given account. Uh, and the cool thing about this is that on a, with a link, you have to click on it. With the form, you have to click on the button. With an image, you don't have to. As soon as it's parsed, the request is made. Uh, but these kind of attacks are actually not that hard to defend them from, because first, you can make like an API where these things are not so simple, or they don't use like get requests. And another thing is and um, uh, to use CSP. If you don't know what CSP is, don't worry. Stefan's going to talk about it a bit later. Uh, but the point here is that you can say that, hey, my page won't allow requests to any other size, just the ones that I, I'm letting it. No problem. You can still do something funky if uh, that given page uses Facebook tracking. You can say that this image is sourced at Facebook. OK, why would I do that? Well, you would do that because Facebook has tracking and tracking pixels. So if a page uses uh, Facebook tracking already, then uh, sending requests to the Facebook server is allowed. Cool. So you set, OK, it's tracking, and you set your own ID. And then we, we're back to the thing with the uh, first, um, first CSS property, where this by itself is not uh, dangerous, but the attacker can gather information about the users who are using that site, which will be useful when uh, creating a, a bigger attack. So yeah, this, this is also dangerous. Uh, and the last kind of attack I'd like to talk about uh, is the, my personal favorite. But because it's kind of, you have to ask yourself, what do I consider user input? Well, everything that's an input box, OK, cool. Maybe all those buttons where upload something, yeah, those are also dangerous. But there are other stuffs too. Because everything that you send to a server is basically just a user input. So I don't know if uh, where you work have any kind of like internal applications. Uh, at some point, uh, I worked uh, on a product where we had one, where we basically gathered uh, all the requests and, and like scraped a few uh, headers, for example, the user agent and the client IP. So we had like our own internal statistics about it. But this was like an internal app. You couldn't view it outside of the office. So we were like, yeah, it's not, we don't have to be scared. Nobody can attack this but because nobody can open the page. Well, it turns out they can, because you can set your user agent to a malicious script. You can set your client IP to anything. If you use, use Postman or just like a command line tool, it, you can set it to anything. Uh, usually the browser says these things, but if you avoid using a browser, then it's, it's fair game. And in this case, imagine you have a really simple internal app where you just list all the user agents so you know what kind of users, uh, what kind of browsers your users are using. So if you list them and you render them, bam, the, the script is executed. Again, bad things happen. So I'd like you to take home this notion that non-user facing doesn't mean non-attackable. Non That's why it's called blind XSS. 
because an attacker can blindly send out requests, uh, and it's really easy to automate. And uh, some, if you manage to send out like thousands uh, of these, there's one place where they have an internal app like that, and they forgot to sanitize the input, and bam, you, you got a successful attack. Okay. Uh, the goal of this talk wasn't to like show you how to defend against these things, but I don't feel too good without at least saying a few words about this. Uh, so here's a too long didn't read version of uh, of this. Validate and sanitize input. Make sure that it's clean. Beware of images. It's really hard to get it right. In my opinion, if you want to have like upload a profile picture or something like that, the only good way to go is to have it actually uh, being stored on your own server, let them upload the blob, and that's it. Uh, don't try to be smart, don't write your own sanitizer, don't come up with your own ideas. It's really hard to get these things right. So for example, the, Google, the sanitizer that Google uses is an open source project. It's all over the internet, and that XSS vulnerability I showed you earlier was there for three months. So these things are really, really hard to spot, and I'm guaranteeing you, if you're writing your own, there will be a few vulnerabilities there. Also, use the frameworks. Uh, if you use like Angular or React, they already pretty much sanitize uh, your outputs, so you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, only please don't use like set danger dangerously set inner HTML and stuff like that. It's in their name. Take care. Uh, a little notion here, frameworks can also have bugs, so, ma so make sure that you're, um, trying, you're always updating your framework. It's actually a, a really good way to uh, give a reason why you want to use the latest cool Angular React feature to your boss. You can say that, hey, there's like a security hole we need to update. Yeah, please don't use that. <laughs> it's just a joke. Yeah, uh, and if you're talking about third-party stuff, we're all using a lot of NPM packages. If one of them has a bug and a vulnerability, our site is vulnerable too. So please uh, update them um, uh, as regularly as you can. There are good tools to make sure that everything's fine. NPM audit, uh, the GitHub. Um, GitHub has a feature like this. Uh, Sneak is really good at this, and there are some other products. So it's easy to, uh, not easy, but it doesn't require uh, that much uh, focus to get this right. So, please, stay safe. It's hard to stay safe, but it's worth it. But I'd also like to put an uh, emphasis on to have fun while you're doing this. There's beauty in these things, and I think it's worth actually seeking out. Thank you very much. <laughs>